tonight, more bloodshed in Mexico. Another journalist killed this week. As we see that camera person just got shot. Last year, record numbers of journalists were imprisoned. Many others were attacked and murdered just for doing their jobs. I am pressed. I don't care if you're down. Okay, I'm down. I'm Avantika Chalkoti. I'm the international correspondent at The Economist. For many journalists, being able to report freely is becoming much harder. But this isn't just happening in authoritarian states. I'm not going to give you a question. Can you stay counter? You are fake news. In 2022, press freedom is being eroded in democracies too. Is this the price one needs to pay to speak the truth? And governments everywhere are using more subtle tactics to muzzle independent media. It's always about silencing the target. Which is bad news for global democracy. I want to find out what's going on and how the freedom of the press can be protected. There's just no word for it. And you just feel that I wish it could just stop. I felt like I have been slut shamed and I have been made naked for the public. It was a virtual lynch mob that is out there to get me. Rana Ayub is an award-winning journalist based in India. Her work has appeared in publications around the world. She's reported on the rise of Hindu nationalism in India and on corruption in Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government. Her work has drawn the attention of the authorities, who are trying to shut her up. I think the authorities are trying to silence me because they find my truth unpalatable. It's not a popular truth. It's something that reveals them, exposes them. They believe that I am trying to discredit their image internationally. Rana, so nice to meet you. I really wanted to talk to Rana because for the past few years, she's faced unimaginable online abuse and harassment. What I'm living right now is a nightmare uh, that I had not anticipated. Death and rape threats. I get burnt copies of my book at my residence. But the other day I was in a new studio in Bombay and I got a message on my phone that we are standing downstairs. We know where you are. My image was morphed on a porn video and circulated all over the country. Slut shamed into silence. Many of those threats appear to come from members of the public, online trolls who don't like what Rana stands for. But government harassment is also becoming increasingly explicit. There is the constant fear of being arrested. There is a constant fear of being surveilled upon. I have at least four cases which I'm facing right now. Two from the Uttar Pradesh police, one from the Enforcement Directorate, one by the Income Tax Department. I am 100% convinced it's all by the government. Rana is not alone. In the world's largest democracy, Press freedom is enshrined in the Constitution. But harassment of journalists has increased under the Bharatiya Janata Party, who came to power in 2014. Prime Minister Modi, the leader of the party, has been described as a predator of press freedom. Pressure has increased on media organisations to tow the government line. There's a pattern of critical journalists being intimidated with online hate campaigns, police violence, and even criminal prosecution. It's a living, breathing, claustrophobic feeling. I've worked as a foreign correspondent in India, and to witness today's state silencing of its media is shocking. India is 150th out of 180 countries on the Global Press Freedom Index having fallen eight places in a single year. And it is by no means the only democracy languishing in the bottom half. The index is compiled by Reporters Without Borders, a charity that campaigns for independent journalism. Its director of international campaigns is Rebecca Vincent. Press freedom has steadily deteriorated around the world year by year. Even our democracies, when we look at the performance of, for example, Europe, uh, which has long been the region that respects press freedom the most, even there. Why is press freedom getting worse? And in particular, why in democracies? We've had geopolitical issues. We've had economic issues, which also impact the media. I mean, we also saw some leaders taking advantage of attention being on the pandemic to maybe accelerate 
pre-existing crackdowns or start to implement new restrictions. And then of course, COVID related restrictions as well. In some countries, we saw a real backlash against independent reporting, targeting of journalists who were actually reporting the truth on figures in their country or, or taking a critical approach to their, to their governments. I guess you think about the media as an important part of democracy. It's the way in which you'd hold a government accountable. It's the way in which people, members of the public, can share their stories and what they want and need. And so if you don't have that mechanism, you don't have that dialogue, it's pretty hard to imagine how you can have a strong and vibrant democracy. Another index, compiled by the Economist Intelligence Unit, uses media freedom as one of the indicators to measure how democratic a country is. I believe that the decline of the Indian media really explains the steep downfall of India as a democracy. How can you continue to be a democracy when you do not have a vibrant press? Not long after we interviewed Rana, her bank accounts were frozen by the government. Constant surveillance, harassment and abuse are taking their toll. Look at me, I've been unable to work. I was supposed to step out to go and report this election season in India. And I'm fighting a case and I'm fighting battles. I have to go to court to get my account unfreezed. You don't know what's coming and you want to do your work, you want to report, you want to tell the world your story and you want to tell the world that it's difficult to do journalism and you can't do it. And I don't know what's, what the future holds for me. For some journalists, the attacks can be fatal. 21 reporters were murdered in 2021 and nearly 40% of those murders took place in democracies. country's leading investigative journalist, described as a one-woman WikiLeaks. Daphne Caruana Galizia died when a car bomb exploded in her vehicle. Galizia led the Panama Papers investigation. Some feel her murder is a sign of threats to freedom of speech. I never imagined that someone would target my mother in this way. In 2017, Daphne Caruana Galizia, a Maltese journalist, was murdered. The 53-year-old Galizia was a specialist in reporting on corruption. Her son accused senior politicians of being complicit. Daphne's investigations into the Maltese government and business elite had made her the most read journalist in the country. She was just so, so fierce in the way that she defended those stories and in the way that she defended the facts of the case, um, the way that she defended her sources. But her work also created many enemies. Who on earth would have an interest in reporting me to the police and asking for my arrest because of an article about the leader of the opposition? In the years leading up to her assassination, Daphne endured threats, intimidation and attacks, as well as another less conspicuous form of harassment. By the time she was killed, she was facing 47 libel suits. Five were criminal defamation, they're cases that could have put her in jail. Those lawsuits didn't die with Daphne. Much to their horror, her family inherited all of the cases. This to me was unbelievable. I mean, my mother had just been murdered and we inherited this entire sort of structure which had been set up to threaten my mother. It was just passed on to us. These lawsuits are known as strategic lawsuits against public participation, or SLAPs. They're a powerful way for people with deep pockets to deter scrutiny. Some of the SLAPs against Daphne came from government politicians, including the Prime Minister of Malta himself. The cases against my mother were, were taking up the, the vast majority of her time. It was just all designed to sort of harass, intimidate her, make her life miserable. It was really superhuman that, that she was able to continue her reporting. Over the past few years, there has been a rise in the use of slaps against journalists, particularly in Europe. In Poland, one newspaper alone has received almost 60, many of which have been brought by politicians from the ruling party. 
Very often there isn't a case. Well, the point is you don't actually need a case because you're not trying to achieve justice. It's always about silencing the target. The whole point of a slap case is to harass, to intimidate, and to make an example of the defendant to other people, and to wear that person down so that they no longer pursue the story. Fighting a case can cost the defendant a fortune. Often the only option is to take the content down. Most people are not able or willing to take on these risks, these financial risks, these reputational risks in fighting it, so it can result in self-censorship. That is incredibly hard to, to counter. It's, it's hard to fight back against, and in fact, self-censorship in that way can be one of the biggest challenges to free expression globally. It's my civil society. As well as continuing to fight the lawsuits, Matthew and Corinne campaign to make it harder for slaps to be brought against journalists. And at the end of April 2022, the European Commission proposed a new directive that would allow journalists and activists to appeal to the courts to throw out some slaps. The laws have to be changed so that they no longer can be abused in the interests of plaintiffs. Every time I learn about a journalist being targeted in this way, I feel for them in the same way that I felt about my mother at the time. It sort of hits me in the same way. This is why we've taken this up as a campaign. I mean, we have to do something to stop it. It's not just the individual journalists who are being targeted. Whole media outlets are coming under pressure too. In 2022, Hungary's Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, was elected for a fifth time. It's been over a decade now since Mr. Orban first came to power. And in that time, here in Hungary, press freedom has gone into decline. The government's weapon of choice seems to be financial bullying. Much of the advertising revenue in Hungary comes from the government. By not placing adverts with independent media companies, the government has been able to destroy their income and drive some of them into bankruptcy and the Prime Minister's wealthy cronies have taken over many of the country's most popular media outlets. Veronica Monk worked for Hungarian news organization Index for almost two decades. Index was the largest and most influential online news daily uh, in Hungary. Everyone who wanted to know what's happening in the country, they just clicked on Index and got unbiased news. But Veronica found that being able to report freely was becoming much harder. In the last couple of years of Index, it became more and more obvious that our independent operation will not be possible anymore. Some very, very well-known oligarchs came and go uh, on, the, on the top of the ownership structure of the company who owned Index. Then the editor-in-chief was fired. In recent weeks, the company have expressed concern that their media and editorial freedom is under threat from external forces. And just two days ago, the company's editor-in-chief, Shabal's door, well, he was sacked. It was a very clear move, a very clear expression that they don't want to let us work independently anymore. On the day Index's editor-in-chief was fired, more than 70 of its journalists quit. The same day, at the evening, there was a large protest on the streets of Budapest. Thousands of people were marching on the street, shouting beside freedom. I was at home, totally tired, crying my eyes out. But I knew that the only mistake that we can do if we do not try to stick together and create something new. Because those people, thousands of them, express that they want to consume fact-based quality journalism. Together, Veronica and her colleagues set up a new independent organisation, Telex. So this is Telex, this is our, our newsroom. This is our new office we moved in a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about sort of setting this up? You know, what does it involve starting a media outlet from scratch? First of all, it was extremely tiring. We needed to find out how we will have money. 
we knew that we cannot rely on advertisement revenue because of the political influence of the advertisement market. So we decided, okay, let's turn to our readers. We put a message on YouTube. Let's másik. Ez rajtad is múlik. I said something like, guys, you know us, you know what we can do, please give us money. It became really successful. In the first month, we collected 1 million euros. So we could launch, we could hire almost the whole team, and we could start the operation very quickly. Almost two years on, around 600,000 people read Telex every day. Its funding comes almost entirely from its readers. But Hungary remains a hostile environment for journalists. Many people are really so much involved emotionally in politics, they don't care about the facts anymore. Nearly 80% of Hungarian media is owned by allies of Orbán's government. Despite the efforts of Telex, freedom of the press continues to deteriorate. Being a critical journalist is hard. It's really hard to get into press conferences, for instance, or know about press conferences. So we wanted to talk with the MEPs. There was like a fencing. So Anything basically they stop you to yeah, ask usual, questions. The yeah. usual. This is the fourth time that the Orban government got two-thirds of the parliament seats, which gives them a large potential in every field in the Hungarian life. I expect difficulties. I expect that access to information will be as difficult as before. And I'm really concerned, or I could say afraid, what comes next. Joining us tonight is the extraordinary independent investigative journalist Rana Ayub. At the Frontline Club in London, Rana Ayub is a guest on a panel discussing attacks against female reporters. And then I felt that I'm better off kind of on my own and going a different way. That just caused me so much anxiety and distress. Why do we have to lose one journalist to violence? It's inspiring to witness their bravery and ambition, but it's also shocking. Is there any reason for optimism that the press might get freer over time? I do believe there is hope, but I also know it's going to be a challenge for each one of us. It's a depressing story, but even at this time when there are so many attacks against journalists, what you do see is that reporters find ways around the tools that governments are using against them. Be it technology, be it physical harassment, reporters keep finding ways to do their work. And that has to be a reason for optimism. To read more of our coverage on press freedom, click the link and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.